أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Hope everybody is well Alhamdulillah Some tired faces there Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah we continue our series on the revival uh, of, of Islam, the revival of the Islamic spirit. And we are talking about the four Imams, but we're not just doing their biography. We are, we are trying to show that their contribution cont uh, uh, helped to lay the foundation of what Orthodox Islam really is. You must remember that every single book of Allah that was revealed before the Qur'an and every religion and sharia that Allah revealed before, Islam, before the coming of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was changed and fabricated by its ulama, by its scholars. And therefore it took a great effort by the scholars of this ummah to keep it preserved. We saw Imam Malik's contribution in preserving the hadith. And now we see the scholars using that foundation of knowledge to answer modern day issues. As the world moves on, they built an institution of learning that transcended themselves, their, uh, um, their own locality. It is something which could be used across the ummah. You would find the Maliki Madhab all the way in America, in uh, the, the far west of the world, and you have the Shafi Madhab in the far east of the world, and the foundations of these Madahib are basically the same. So today we talk about the next great Imam, and uh, 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 by all accounts, the second Mujaddid of the Ummah. The first Mujaddid, the first reviver, is credited to be Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, a great Khalifa. The next Mujaddid that most people contribute, the, the Mujaddid of the second century, or the third century actually, is Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, Imam Shafi. His name was Muhammad ibn Idris. His name is Muhammad. Most people say I'm Shafi, I don't know the Imam's name. It's Muhammad ibn Idris. And subhanAllah, and how apt, he was born in Gaza. The same Gaza we're seeing being bombed today. Imam Shafi was born in Gaza, in Palestine. And one thing that stands out with him compared to the other Imams is he is Ahlul Bayt. He's actually a Hashimi, a Qurashi, a descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So a noble lineage. Subhanallah, Imam Shafi'i, um, soon after he was born, his father died. And his mother was left in a very, very desperate situation in Gaza without much support. And she knew that he, the, the, the Imam Shafi'i had some relatives in Mecca. And she felt, look, let me take him to Mecca. And perhaps there would be a, a, an, an a upbringing uh, for him, a future for him in Mecca. He was born the same year Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. And that's subhanAllah, another interesting thing. Scholars say as the sun set on one great uh, uh, star, another star is born, walhamdulillah. So Imam Shafi is taken as a very young boy to Mecca and very, very poor family. I mean, he's a single mom. And it's amazing, you'd find Imam Malik, like we said yesterday, was really inspired by his mom. Imam Shafi is raised by a single mom. And we're going to speak about Imam Ahmad, also raised by a single mother. SubhanAllah, these men, these giants of the Ummah really inspired and were molded by not only women, but by single mothers. Imam Shafi's mom comes to Mecca and she knows that her boy is very special in that he's, he's very quick, he's very intelligent, he's very smart. And she wants to enroll him into the madrasa in the Haram. Now, subhanAllah, back in the day, education was a privilege. Only the wealthy got to send their kids to study. The lay people, you, you, you had to work. And only the, the, the very elite got to study deen. And perhaps, subhanAllah, today it's the other way around. That, uh, the, that if you can't get into medicine, you can't get into engineering, you can't do anything, okay, you can do khids rather. And that's a problem. That's the reality of what we have today. And therefore, the pipeline that comes out of our ulama is not the best of the best. The time of Imam it was different. The cream of the crop got to go to the haram and they got to sit in the classes of the of the great ulama of the time and therefore the best of the best came through that pipeline but it also required money and so imagine this single mom going to the shuyukh of the haram and saying i've got a boy can he sit in the class can he learn hifth and we don't have any money and everything and they wanted to turn him away then they found out that this boy is ahlul bayt and they said how can i turn away a descendant of the prophet the Prophet who brought us knowledge, we're going to turn away a great, great, great grandson of his. We can't do that. They felt embarrassed to do that. And so Imam Shafi, based on his lineage, was allowed to attend the classes. And by seven, he memorized the Quran, subhanAllah. Photographic memory. 
his memory was something else. He, he would say, I had to cover the page because if I saw it, it almost like stuck in my mind. I, to focus on one page, I had to cover the other one. My brain was too quick. And so at seven years old, he memorized the Quran. By 10, he was memorizing Imam Malik's Muwatta already. That book that we spoke about, he was already memorizing the Muwatta. And uh, mashallah, Imam uh, Shafi mentions that because he was so poor, he could not afford stationery, and so he was forced to memorize. And this helped him with his memory. Whereas other kids are taking notes, he doesn't have stationery. He's using whatever leaves and stuff he has, and so he's forced to memorize. And because, he, because he's poor, he doesn't live in Mecca, he actually lived on the outskirts amongst the Bedouins in the desert. And what this did was, the Bedouins had a mastery of the Arabic language. And so amongst all the ulama, Imam Shafi is actually like a professor in Arabic as well, and a poet. Besides his fiqh and his sharia, he's actually an expert in the field of linguistics and Arabic language because he grew up in the deserts of Mecca with the Arabs, and he had no problem dressing like them. He kind of owned it. You know, when all the other kids coming from their posh families, they were dressed in their very fancy clothes, he came like a Bedouin, and he liked that. And he continued his life always dressed like this Bedouin. He's a very odd-looking guy, but he's, of course, uh, leaps and bounds ahead of everybody. And so Imam Shafi, as we said, he himself mentions, after I finished memorizing the Quran, I would go to the masjid, and I would sit amongst the scholars of hadith in particular to memorize. And I used to live in Mecca amongst the dwellers of the poor, and I couldn't afford any paper to write on, so I would use bones or whatever, little things I could find out, trash, in the, and I would write on there. Now, once he was a teenager, was already by 13, 15, the grand muftis of the haram, they took a very like a great liking to him. They saw that this boy has a lot of potential, and he also had a beautiful voice. So they would say, if we wanted to cry, we made Shafi'i the Imam, and when he would recite, we would melt our hearts. And the, the Imams already gave him a tazkiyah before he was 20 to start issuing fatawa. That, you know, people can come to you and ask you questions and you can give them fatawa. The uh, 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 mufti of the haram, uh, uh, Zangi, gave him the title of mufti. You can continue before he's 20. But his greatest dream, his greatest hope was to go to Medina because Imam Malik was still alive. And he wanted to attend the Harvard of Islamic studies in the class of Imam Malik. And he must have applied in some one, how they used to apply, and he got rejected. You're still a boy, you're still young, you need to learn, you still need to. You got, uh, teenagers are allowed to sit in my class. Eventually, the Mufti of Mecca and the Amir of Mecca had to write a letter to Imam Malik to say, please, just look at this boy, just give him a chance. He is something very, very special. And they gave, it, they gave this letter, two letters, one from the Mufti of the Haram of Mecca and one from the Amir of Mecca to go to Medina, go to, go to Medina and go and give him these letters and ask him if he will allow you to sit in his classes. And when Imam Shafi comes to Imam Malik, he takes the letter, he reads it, and his response is, so this is how the students of knowledge want to get into classes now, by connections, right? That's how you people want to get into classes nowadays, okay? Um, and so then he said to him, so, they say you, you know, a, a, a student, you're very educated. Have you heard of my book, The Muwatta? He asked Imam Shafi. So Imam Shafi says, I've heard of it. I said, have you read it? He said, I've memorized it, Sheikh. He said, ah. Oh. So he says, oh, you've memorized my book. Come to the haram of Medina after Asr, we'll test you. And when Imam Malik's class came the next day, I taught after Asr, he's, he's sitting now with his class. These are like PhD students. He says, this young boy, this young man says he's memorized my book. Begin, Bismillah, read from the beginning, from memory. And it took him like until the next day, he read and he stopped and he had to read, reading the whole Muwatta from memory. After that, he was allowed to stay in the class. <laughs> he was allowed to stay in the class. And so he stays with Imam Malik for about eight years. And we know that Imam Malik is very, not stingy with praise, but Imam Malik is who he is. But he had this thing to say about Imam Shafi. He says, no scholar more brilliant than Muhammad ibn Idrisa Shafi ever came to me as a pupil. This is my best student I've ever had. He is the best, the brightest student that ever attended my class. Giving the Tazgas great words from Imam Malik. And Imam Shafi, on his part, he would always say, when he says, Qala Shaykhi, my Sheikh said something, he's talking about Imam Malik. He has many, many shuyukh, but he's closest Sheikh. He says, in every salah, I make dua for Imam Malik. In every salah, I make dua for Imam Malik. So, 
we see that these madahib have actually built one on the other and there's great love and admiration between them. After Imam Malik passes away, Imam Shafi has now been like a student for almost 30 years. He wants to see the world. He wants to go and ex experience life. And he hears that there's a position in Yemen to be a judge. So he goes to Yemen to be a judge and it's a complete disaster. He finds the world is not as, e as nice as Mecca and Medina. And people are not the same. And he finds somehow he gets involved in politics and intrigue and he ends up being shipped to Baghdad to be executed. It's a long story. But he, he gets caught up in a conspiracy. People frame him. They tell, they tell the Khalifa that he's part of a, of a rebel movement. Anyway, he's about to be executed. And as his name comes on the chopping block for execution, one of the judges is Muhammad al-Shaybani, which was Abu Hanifa's student who also met Imam Malik, and so they said, this is Shafi'i. So now the dots are connecting. This guy Shafi'i was one of Imam Malik's top students. How is this guy being executed, accused of treason? And so the judge investigates, and he speaks to him Shafi'i, and he realizes, oh, this is all conspiracy, and they intercede with the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid, and he, of course, exonerates Imam Shafi'i, and so Imam Shafi'i now says, that's it. I'm not for, cut for politics, I am a scholar. I'm just meant to teach. And so, Imam Shafi spends some time now in Baghdad and he gets to meet Imam Abu Hanifa's madhab and his students and uh, this is where the, the scholars of the Hanafi madhab, they mention that it appeared like our school and the Maliki school will never be able to bridge this gap. The Ahlul Hadith and the Ahlul Ra'i, we couldn't find a common ground. Even though we came to the same conclusion, we could not articulate a system where we were united. Then Imam Shafi came and he somehow merged our two sort of thinking and they said the door of fiqh appeared to be closed the people until Allah sent Imam Shafi and he's the Mujaddid, the reviver of fiqh. Now this is again great words from the students of Abu Hanifa about him. And Imam Shafi now changes what was his old madhab, his own way of thinking, to a new way of thinking based on the principles as well that he learns from the Hanafi madhab and he writes, his seminal work is called ar risala which is the laws by which we extract Islamic ruling. So how do you extract rules, uh, laws, and fiqh and sharia? He wrote the first book in this field. And amongst, I mean, subhanAllah, he wrote over 100 treaties and books. And now he becomes a type of uh, uh, um, traveling professor. He would travel and ultimately he settles down back, he comes back to Mecca and now he's teaching in the Haram. And now he's teaching in the Haram of Mecca and his classes, as we said, subhanAllah, there's a beautiful narration. We'll talk about Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal later on. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, we'll speak on tomorrow, but he travels around the world and he gets to Mecca and he learns and he's a very studious uh, scholar, Imam Ahmed, very serious scholar. He doesn't bunk classes. And his friends saw that Imam Ahmad is not going to class anymore. You know, he's, he's missing from the class, the hadith class. The big sheikhs, Imam Ahmad isn't there. So they're looking, where is Ahmad? And they find him sitting there in the back of the haram with this guy dressed up like a Bedouin. And they said, you've left the Grand Mufti of Mecca to learn from this Bedouin. Who is this guy? So Imam Ahmad says, if you missed something from the Grand Mufti, You'll get it tomorrow. But if you miss something from this guy, no one on earth speaks like him. And they sat down, this is Imam Shafi. This was when he just started teaching. Imam Ahmad was one of the first people to recognize this is someone, this is someone special. And every year, Imam Ahmad would come and make Hajj. He would see Imam Shafi's class getting bigger and bigger until he was sitting in the big chair of the Haram. And he was the main event of the Haram, Imam Shafi, Rahimullah. And he would be teaching his classes of fiqh would be packed. The Haram would basically stand still for the classes of Imam Shafi. And his, his uh, books and his writing, of course, one of the great things of his legacy was he has a, a, an, an encyclopedia, a library of books, a hundred books and letters that he's written, which basically fa uh, laid the foundation of the madhab system. Um, Imam Shafi, uh, uh, just for, for interest sake, he, he, he married, he had one wife, and uh, he had four children, and he had the habit of, you know, was highly productive in his time. So how did he do all this? How do you write? Look, he lived only, how many years did he live? He lived like just 50 odd years, but he wrote 100 books. 54 years and he wrote 100 books. How do you do that? And there was barakah, of course, in his time, but he was very strict in terms of how he disbursed his time. One third was for his studying and writing. One third, of course, 
course for ibadah, personal ibadah, and one third for sleeping. A lot of you know the ulama they mention things about the personal ibadat, and we don't know how how exaggerated it is, but it's well documented that in Ramadan, Imam Shafi would finish two khatams a day. Allah alam, that's how you would. That's, subhanallah, that's it's well documented that that's how much he will read of Quran. In day, Allah Allah alam, Allah puts barakah in his time, and uh, as we said, in his terms of his personality. A bit different to Imam Malik, he was a lot more softer, a lot more jovial, a lot more, uh, he had a sense of humor. He would ask his students questions, and once he was sitting very formal, uh, um, formal and, and teaching the class, it's now Sharia, it's very strict, and he asked the question, and the answer was so bad that he basically like took his turban off and he sat back. He said, well, if you're not going to take the class seriously, I'm not going to take the class seriously as well. So he's, he has a rapport with his students, and based on that, subhanAllah, as we would say, it's, it's a, a combination of knowledge and personality that causes his madhab to spread. And he's invited throughout the world to come and teach. Um, Subhanallah, the Nabi Sallallahu mentions, Truly Allah shall send forth from this community at the onset of every hundred years someone who will renew and revive Islam. It is basically by unanimous consensus that he was the second Mujaddid after uh, uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And if you look at the scholars that ascribe to the Shafi'i Madhab, and many of these scholars you would know. Uh, Imam Nawawi, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi, the very famous, the 40th, this is Imam Nawawi, is, is one of the great Shafi'i scholars. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the man who made tafsir or explained Sahih Bukhari. Imam Ghazali, a very famous Shafi'i scholar. Ibn Kathir, the man who wrote the tafsir, Ibn Kathir. All these are Shafi'i scholars, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. And it is now, we could say, currently, if you were to talk about orthodox Islam, it would really be a combination of Shafi'i madhab. It is sort of the dominant madhab in the world at the moment. And we'll talk maybe later on how his madhab sort of expanded. It didn't happen overnight. And then uh, his death there is a bit of a sad tone to the way he passed away, rahimullah. Imam Shafi'i is invited to Egypt. And he's a visiting professor. And he's giving a lecture. And of course, he now differs a lot with his Imam, Imam Malik. Even though he says, my sheikh said this and that. But I have a different opinion and based on my learning. And he gives a contrary view. Now, Imam Malik at the time, he's passed away, but he still has the status of Malik. Like, you know, you can't challenge Imam Malik. And it's mentioned that, subhanAllah, one of Imam Malik's students was so angry that he actually attacked Imam Shafi'i that injured him, and this caused him to die. And that's why he's buried in, he's buried in Egypt. And subhanAllah, we see once again, another thing we learn, that Imam, these great Imams build a legacy. But we can also become fanatical about our Imams and our Shuyukh, and this goes against everything that they taught. Imam Shafi'i on his deathbed, uh, uh, for, uh, obviously his injury was fatal, but he, he was able to, to, to and he's, you know, he's actually versifying this in poetry. He says, I'm journeying from this world and departing from my brothers, and I drink from the cup of death, and upon Allah exalted is his remembrance that I arrive. And, and know by Allah, I do not know if my soul is traveling to Jannah to be welcomed or to Jahannam to be distressed. I don't know. He's like, he's worried. And then he says, and I am a sinner. I am a criminal. When my heart becomes constricted and my path becomes narrow, I took my hope in your pardon and forgiveness as an opening and escape. So he says, Ya Allah, when I think about my life, I feel I'm, you know, I don't deserve Jannah. I think of all my sins, but then I think of your mercy and I feel comfortable that inshallah you will assist me. My sins seem very great to me, but when I compare them to your forgiveness and your mercy, I find your forgiveness even greater. These are on the last few words that he, and it's a poem, he's reciting this in poetry form as he passes away. And Imam Shafi is, uh, as I said, died in Egypt and he's buried in in Egypt rahimullah his madhab as we said is basically currently today you would say the orthodox madhab of the ummah but all of them rahimullah we continue tomorrow with Imam Ahmad with the first major theological test of this ummah the first time our ummah was going to go through a type of corruption the deen it took these imams to build up a legacy so that we could face the fight we're going to face tomorrow, inshallah, with Imam Ahmad. Zakla khair. Just one. Okay, the questions. What is the book that uh, Imam Malik wrote? It's the Muwatta. Uh, I don't know where's our where's our tickets here. Oh, uh, Maimoon. Right. I can't make this one out. Uh, Abdurrahman Daniels is here. Abdurrahman, yeah? Not here tonight. Uh, Shamil Ariftin. Okay, mashallah. And Auntie Anisa Sali. 
Auntie Anissa, yeah? MashaAllah. Mubarak to Auntie Anissa. Tonight's question, Imam Shafi was a student of whom? Abu Hanifa, Imam Ghazali, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad al Hanbal. InshaAllah, it's easy answer. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi salam wa salim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. D. Yeah, when you're a Badu, I'm going to ask you a question before.